This is our ninth session on 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22. Let's pick it up in verse 15. See that no one pays, repays anyone evil for evil, but always pursue good toward one another and toward everyone. Always rejoice. Without ceasing, pray. In all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The Spirit do not quench, prophecies do not despise, but everything test what is good, hold fast. From every form of evil, abstain. Now, if that reads awkward to you, because I have put the verbs last, abstain. Hold fast, test, not despise, not quench, give thanks, pray, rejoice, pursue good. I rewrote that. I translated it awkwardly because the Greek is strikingly consistent. The verbs are always. Second, not first. So the Greek doesn't actually say, even though I know word order in Greek is not decisive, nevertheless, it is optional for Paul to do the one or the other, and he does this. He says, always pursue good, always rejoice, without ceasing, pray, in all circumstances, give thanks. That's the way he puts it. And I think the effect that it has in putting first the always, always, without ceasing, all circumstances, is to thrust forward into our consciousness in an unavoidable way how pervasive this lifestyle is supposed to be. No exceptions. Now, to show you why we're going to focus only on verses, uh, maybe this right here, is because in this list of exhortations, this for, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, Clearly, because of that, because right there relates this direction and breaks the flow. So, this is not an argument in this direction, it's an argument in this direction. And so, it cuts the list in half. And we can see that that's intentional because the next group are very closely related. The spirit don't quench, prophecies don't despise. You can see how closely related that is. The spirit. And prophecies and and then testing everything. So this right here is intended to be take taken as a unit, and therefore I'm assuming Paul means by putting this ground clause in here, intends for us to take this unit as going together. So that's what we're going to focus on. Father, I pray that as we look at the command to pursue good and the command to rejoice and the command to pray, and the command to give thanks, that you would teach us glorious things about yourself and about what the Christian life is. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the the first question. Why does this get inserted here? For this What's just gone before, presumably, is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He said that back in 4 3. This is the will of God for you, your holiness. And that's very closely related to pursuing good. And he says it again here. This is the will of God. Why? Everything Paul commands is the will of God. So he doesn't need to stick this in after every command, like, Pursue good. This is the will of God for you. Rejoice. This is the will of God for you. Pray. This is the will of God for you. 
but he does insert it here after this list and before these. What's the effect of that? And I'll draw out two effects that I see. When I hear him say, all right, I've just given you four commands. Pursue good toward one another and everyone. Rejoice. Pray. Give thanks. And then he adds, this is the will of God for you. Shouts, God is the kind of God that, what? Wants you to come to him and ask him for things. He's a good father. Come, ask me. I'm not the kind of God that so many have. Here's a warning in Acts 17, 25. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So come to me, ask, ask. I don't need you. You need me. Or Romans eleven thirty six, from him, through him, to him are all things. That's why he gets glory. We pray to him. He doesn't pray to us. We depend on him for all things. He doesn't depend on us for anything. So the first thing, when he says, it's the will of God that you pray, that's like saying to your child, it's my will that you ask me for what you need. Ask me. Come to me. I'm your father. Secondly, he's the kind of God who wants you to experience answers to prayer for which you can continually be thankful. He wants a thankful people who are overflowing with benefit in answer to his prayers. Third, he's the kind of God, let's put this in red, who wants you happy. He's commanding you to be happy. I mean, none of the pagan gods were like that. None of them. The God of the Bible, his will is your joy. And so he commands it. And then fourth, he's the kind of God who wants your beseeching him, you're getting answers and being overflowing with thanksgiving, the joy that abounds. He wants you then to overflow with good toward one another and everyone. Yes, he does. It looks like this in 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that was given, has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. So affliction didn't stop it. Poverty didn't stop it. Their abundance of joy overflowed in a wealth of generosity. That's the logic. Grace comes down. Joy rises up. Affliction can't stop it. Poverty can't stop it. It gets so big that it overflows, and the overflow is doing good, doing good toward one another and everyone. So in, by inserting this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, he draws attention to the fact that God is the kind of God who in all eternity wills that his people come to him with requests. He wills that those requests satisfy their souls and fill them with thanks and make them a happy people. And out of the fullness of that kind of relationship with God, they live for the good of other people. That's what I see happening by the insertion of this, for this is the will of God. This is the kind of God he is. And then when it says, he is this in Christ Jesus, I think he's giving an explanation for these always. Always pursue good toward one another. Always rejoice without ceasing, which is another way of saying always pray. 
in all circumstances, which is another way of saying always give thanks. So always, 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 always. And, and our response to that is, are you kidding me? Give thanks in all circumstances? Rejoice always? Do you realize, Paul, what I go through? Do you understand what sorrow and pain are? Well, that's a foolish question, isn't it? Because he knows better than we. And so when you read in Christ, that's where Romans 8.28 resides. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Only in union, in union with Jesus Christ does this come true. If you are outside Christ, all things don't work together for your good. If you are inside Christ, the blood of Christ removes all of God's wrath, replaces it with omnipotent mercy, and causes everything to work together for your good, so that there is in every moment a reason to rejoice. There's always reason to pray. There's always grounds for thanksgiving, and therefore there can always be the flow of pursuing good towards Christians and non-Christians alike. It is a very powerful ground. He is the kind of God who, because of Christ, always, 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 always does us good and wants us happy, thankful, prayerful, and benevolent, good to others.